What is going on ladies and gents? Hope you guys are doing fantastic. Ronnie here from Speed Lab. Once again here with another video for you guys so you guys didn't think I went missing. I try to commit to making videos and I try to do a good job keeping up at it and I get a lot of content and then I just lose like the memory card or the GoPro dies or you know, I just get unmotivated. I'm gonna try once again to commit and keep posting so we can turn this into, you know, a little bit of a financial income and just give you guys more content because we get a bunch of cool cars every day as most of you guys already know, uh, especially to the guys that have been following for a long time. Many thanks to you guys. You know, you guys are the reason why I do this because, you know, there's engagement between me and you guys in the comments and, you know, I love answering your guys' questions. And we're all learning together and I'm hoping to be able to give you guys more content and there's a bunch of stuff, of course, you know, we're, we're talking about the Hoonigan this versus that. I'm gonna have updates for that soon. A bunch of cool stuff coming. But anyway, Anyway, today uh, we have Angel's car here on the lift. So this used to belong to my customer, Miguel. Uh, he came here. I did not do any work on it aside from plugs and I think an oil change or something. Built 2.2 with an FP0. He was limited back then with uh, spring pressure. He does not have a O2 dump. So he has a recirculating FP downpipe. It's a STM downpipe actually, but you know, FPS uh, stainless steel housing and then for the tall gate. So guys, on big power setups, just having this versus having the atmospheric dump, you can limit yourself to 35, 40, even ish wheel horsepower. That's how much the back pressure gets affected. And you usually see this when you see, a, you know, it'll hit like a certain amount of boost and then it'll taper down five, six pounds. Well, that five, six pounds, if you can carry that with a built engine most of the time, you can, unless it's a very poorly built engine with bad components and just, you know, something extremely wrong. You guys can make a lot more power if you can carry that boost all the way. And what wastegate dump, does so the o2 dump does is it allows you to have less back pressure which in turn means you get to make more power even with uh, the same amount of boost because you have less back pressure you tend to make a little bit more power because you have less reversion in, in the intake so uh, and that's whenever the intake valve opens and um, exhaust valves open and the, during the overlap period and then you know you get some in the intake stroke and yada 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 not going to talk about that just know that o2 dump very loud whenever it's open not good for performance good for if you're trying to be low key but i don't know who's low key at 40 pounds of boost <laughs> you catch my drift car is here to go on a haltech 1500 we were running some special so we had some great deals and angel jumped on that and he's also going to get the map sensor uh, wb1 can wideband uh, like i said five bar map sensor 10 bar fuel pressure sensor 10 bar oil pressure sensor so we can have fail safe so god forbid if something happens you, we can prevent a major fail aside from from the how to install on the calibration uh we're also gonna reroute well we're gonna add some spring right now he has, he has about uh, 20 pounds of spring we can load this up to 24. this is gonna be e85 only tune so i'm not really worried about the boost creeping a little bit and you really don't have creep with these setups usually maybe a pound or two but nothing really serious but on pump gas if this drifts to about 27 pounds obviously that's a you know that's that's a no-no with a high compression motor it's you, you usually try to Keep it around 23, 24 pounds. Of course, it depends on the compression. If it's a low comp motor, then you know you can run 30 pounds of boost if it's an eight to one motor, but it's a lot better to um, you know have a little bit of leeway. So that's why if it's a flex fuel car or a dual map car, you know we like to load up the springs a little bit less. 24 pounds, we'll put 20 pound springs in there because usually by red line, it'll kind of you know creep up there. Another thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do top and bottom control on the gate. So not only are we gonna have boost pressure referencing the bottom, which lifts the valve, we're also gonna have pressure at the top, so it's essentially doing double duty. So it helps with boost control a little bit, uh, more finite control, and you get to run a little bit more boost. Uh, again, this is very, very back pressure dependent, but it helps a little bit. The problem we're having is, you know, before the dyno, of course, we're doing a pre-dyno check, cars on the lift, we're doing an oil change for him and two step colder plugs because his goal, his goal is to make uh, 700 horsepower. And, you know, for 700 horsepower, I usually like to go to um, non-projected uh, two step colder plugs on the Evo 8. So they're still gonna be Iridiums, they're still NGKs. They're, they're just not, not projected. You do have to, to drop the plug gap a little bit as you know the actual spark plug electrode is not projected. So it's not out in the combustion area. It's actually inside the spark plug. So you do need a little bit more spark energy. And if you have too big of a gap, it'll have a hard time jumping that gap. So we like to keep it kind of tight. Doesn't hurt it. The way I look at it and the way I see it, and from my experience, it's either gonna fire or it's not. So, you know, you don't get a crazy idle quality, you know, going up like crazy, unless you're running like 60 thou of gap and, you know, you're really putting a very strong flame front in there. 
Anyway, so the problem was when the car came in, I can't start it now, I should have filmed this earlier. It had a really loud ticking sound. Now, the first thing everybody thinks of is lifter tick. So you can kind of, one can kind of tell by the ear if it's lifter tick or if it's something else. I always like to think it's lifter tick, but I always like to double check. So the way we do that is, of course you can pull the pan right away, but what we like to do is pull, pull the filter off. We got a filter cutting tool, put it in there, spin it off, cut the filter, look inside. And of course we saw some Babbitt material. So gave Angel a call and told him exactly what was going on. The oil didn't look like, uh, the oil did not look metallic, but we did see Babbitt material between the filter element. So, you know, it could all be from, let's say the previous client had a failure and everything's replaced, but somehow there were some spots in the oil pan that, you know, were not completely clean. It could be something like that, but we have to check. If I see something like that, I have to make sure that everything is 100% before it goes on the dyno, before we do a pull to 8,500, 9,000 RPM and we chuck a rod and now, you know, have the car catches on fire and the customer has to pay block a cylinder head and all the crankshaft and all the things that could have been avoided if, you know, it gone inspected. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna pull the downpipe because we're going research, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're going uh, dump anyway. And then we're gonna pull the oil pan. He also has a leak from whenever, I don't, I don't know who worked on this car. They did a pretty good job, but whoever worked on it and put the turbo oil return line gasket, I don't think it's the gasket. I think it's, it's you know, there's so much silicone, I can't look at it, but I think it's the actual bolt and the washer that you have to use. There's a specific Mitsubishi washer that you have to use. And we always keep this in stock because this happens a lot. We see this a lot. You use that and it's basically, um, um, copper on the outside and then there there's like this silicone slash plastic ish layer in the middle that seals all the oil and stuff so um it doesn't come off from the you know those two empty recesses in the pan what we're gonna do is i'm gonna put you guys on time lapse when i do that and we're gonna pull the pan once we pull the pan of course we're gonna inspect inside the pan see if you see metal shavings that's the first thing we look at what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the engine at tdc we're gonna take the oil strainer off we're gonna take the stock window tray off and then we're gonna pull rod cap number one and rod cap number two off of course we're gonna number those so we don't mix them up some machinists or some assemblers will mark it but we do it just in case you know it's not marked so we know how to put it back because if you get those mixed up that's going to be a very bad day most of the time the engine won't turn so you'll know where you messed up anyway so that's what we're going to do we're going to inspect the bearings especially number four because number four is the last one that gets oil from the oil pump or essentially the oil gallery but you know until it gets to number four that's essentially the last thing that's getting lubricated in the bottom end bottom end wise and if everything looks good then hooray we're just gonna you know put everything back together i'm gonna show you guys how i stretch rod bolts because we're still gonna stretch it with uh, CMD lube and uh, it's all gonna be good and dandy. If it's not, then I guess it's gonna be an exciting adventure for all of us. I'm gonna put you guys on the time lapse and then I'll see you guys whenever I have the pan off. guys so the gopro cut out of course i actually took the pan out and noticed that it wasn't recording anymore but that happens when uh i try to do anything uh, it doesn't go as planned uh, aside from building engines and tuning that usually goes pretty well <laughs> anyway so we pulled the pan off but oh boy that is not good these are all this is all babbitt bearing material so looking at the connecting rods I haven't taken the actual uh, window tray off yet, but once I take it off, I can get a better picture. But looking at, just looking at them, I don't see anything as far as discoloration or anything weird like that. Uh, so what that means is uh, that uh, we're gonna have to pull, again, number one and number four for right now and see how the bearings look like. Again, I'm, I'm not seeing any discoloration, but I don't think, I wouldn't be surprised if I see major damage as far as bearing wear goes, so. All right, guys, so Tony's behind the camera now. What's up, guys? So we got number one off, because again, the GoPro was being a piece of shit. So um, figured I'll take number one off and then I'll take number four off. So number one doesn't look terrible. I mean, it doesn't look like there's any you know shavings coming off from this at all typical lines and stuff that you know something will get embedded into the bearing but this, these bearings have really good embeddability even though they're performance bearings the oem bearings have a lot more embeddability but they don't have the performance factor that these do so these are tri-metal bearings compared to the factory bimetals anyway so we're gonna pull number four off this might be something related to the mains or it might be something completely related to something that happened previously which i highly doubt because obviously everything gets clean and everything gets replaced so there's no reason for that 
contaminants, especially that much contaminants to be in the oil pans. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over there. Tony's gonna hit the GoPro light and we're gonna take off the cap for number four. And we're just gonna see how number four looks. We're gonna go to number four. Number four has a tendency to crack on stroker crankshafts, especially the manlies. Gotta loosen this tiny bit. Good whack underneath. Gonna separate the cap and the rod. And we can look at number four. So looking at number four, deeper grooves, a little bit of wear on the sides over here, but nothing really concerning. Again, we're not seeing any bearing material. This was kind of expected because whenever we were actually looking at the rod caps, we weren't seeing, seeing any discoloration. Now, I do also want to make sure that on number four, it's not cracked, which the best way to do this would be Magnaflux, but you can kind of tell with a, a trained eye too, but it's gonna be very hard to catch on the camera. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press this up slightly so I can show you guys the top side of the bearing. You guys can see there's a good amount of wear on there, but again, nothing showing, you know, bearing Babbitt material. This obviously gets a harder hit because this is the side that's pushing down and that, that, that has all the weight and the cap side does not get as much uh, load essentially. And it's the exact opposite whenever you're talking about the mains. So if you're doing half extra clearance and half standard size bearings, uh, extra clearance will go on the top for the mains and uh, the thicker ones, the standard clearance will go on the bottom because the bottom is supporting the whole weight. So it looks to me as if we need to keep digging as we're not seeing any bearing material over here. But again, it's it's very concerning that we saw that much bearing material in the filter and in the uh, oil pan. Of course, looking at this, you know, this is not the nicest looking bearing either. Something definitely got in there, but again, not enough to cause anything to, you know, bearing material to go everywhere. So. Yeah, we'll see you guys very short. All right, guys, day two. So we wrapped up the bottom end. So what ended up happening is we actually took off rod caps two and three as well, just to check to see if, you know, the bearing Babbitt material was from that. And even though they didn't look fantastic, there was no, um, you know, there was some embedment, but there was nothing, you know, going through the first layer of the bearing. At that point, you know, if I talked to the customer, I told them, look, it could just be that, um, you know, the ticking noise that we're hearing is in fact a lifter, a bad lifter, or dirty lifters. And it could be residual from whenever they had an engine failure in the past. And because this vehicle did have an engine failure and, you know, they got a new block and everything and all that. And it's a Moroso pan. So I'm like, you know, maybe they didn't take the time to thoroughly clean it. And there was some bearing material left. Just kind of came to an agreement that we're going to proceed because, you know, the, if the rod bearings are looking good, it's very rare for the mains to be, you know, uh, in that bad of a condition. Uh, some of it is going to get through and, you know, hit the rod bearing. So, you know, seeing that there was essentially no damage as far as you know stuff passing through and it was just you know sediments on, on on the bottom of the actual pan i was fairly confident that you know we can proceed so most likely the title of this video is going to be the customer wanted to gamble <laughs> so anyway coming back to the top end uh everything's wrapped up by the way oh we got the stm uh, fp Oh, dump style downpipe now. Well, I put about 24 and a half pound of spring in there before he had uh, two springs. Um, I forgot the color, but uh, now we got the three springs. So 25 pounds of boost is the minimum we can run. This is gonna be 85 only, so not gonna be an issue. And then I also changed the lines to pneumatic lines and put some DEI heat sleeving around it. So we're not gonna melt any wasted lines and uh, yeah, well, the half is gonna have a cut, but you know, you don't wanna melt lines whenever you can prevent it and i also did fix his oil leak uh using those mitsubishi rubber grommets that i was telling you guys about for the turbo drain looking at the top end over here right off the bat you can see that some of these lifters where is it let's just say are loose now this car was running a few minutes ago so that means these lifters have to be pumped up completely because again the car was running. It should take a long time for these lifters to drain down, not instantly. That's the source of our noise. So this is, you know, once we replace these with zero ticks, uh, you know, that's gonna be taken care of. The zero ticks do have a stiffer spring and they're about a quarter of the price compared to if you wanted to get OEM lifters, uh, you know, 16 of them. 
about, I think it's about 40 bucks a pop. So it's about a, a quarter of a fifth of the price. Unfortunately, we do have to pull the timing belt off. So everything is gonna come off now. And that's because of this. So this could be partially because of the clear timing cover that he was using. Sometimes we have, we see issues with the timing cover hitting a portion of the belt. It happens with the carbon fiber ones and people can't notice it. And this one was a clear and we, I didn't even notice it until I took it off. But you guys can see where it's wearing through the belt. And I don't like these Gates belts, you know, call me biased, but I like the Evo 9 carbon Kevlar one because I have it on my car and I rev it to 10 grand with no issues. Hopefully there's nothing else uh, that we need to address as far as the timing stuff goes. Hopefully the hydraulic tensioner is not leaking, the water pump spinning freely and all that good stuff. So the customer doesn't have to spend more money than they projected. At this point, you know, I, I feel bad for Angel because, you know, obviously he wasn't expecting to spend much more than, you know, just what you know, the oil change in the spark was but of course we got to maintain these cars and of course they cost money to maintain and run them at the power levels that we want to run them at i'm gonna take the front cover uh the timing cover and all the accessories off then uh pull the cams as well because we're doing the timing belt at this point uh so there's some overlapping labor so we're gonna pull the cams out too and just show you guys whenever the new lifters are installed and you, yeah just kind of go over everything and then we'll do a startup and then we'll do a dyno video next so this will probably be a video on its own and then we'll have a dyno video following after a lot of people ask me about this kegley racing hla uh regulator i've talked about it in the previous videos but uh, just real quickly to recap limits oil pressure to 15 psi so 15 psi to the cylinder head but not everything it limits it to the lifters because that's essentially all the oil that it needs and it you know keeps it from dumping 100 plus psi of oil pressure to the cylinder head whenever the engine's ice cold and even you know 30 40 psi at idle um whenever you know the engine's warmed up and of course as rpm goes up oil pump speeds up and you know oil pressure increases and uh, again this limits it to a steady 15 which is more than sufficient for everything in, in the valve train to be lubricated properly with that being said i'm gonna get my butt to work all right guys it is day three now today i came in to pull the cams and of course to do the lifters and lo and behold of course the lifters are all destroyed and on the exhaust side as you guys can see what happened here is the retainer is completely chewed up. Essentially the keeper and the retainer are fused together so there's no way I can get this off. But the reason why this happened is because the exhaust valve installed height was set in properly. So this was too low. The protrusion was too low coming out of the retainer and that caused the rocker, the nubs on the rocker, these sides of the rocker to dig into the actual retainer and you know destroy it like that. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you guys can see on camera but those compared to the intake valves, the installed height is completely different. And that's not abnormal to see, but the amount that the protrusion, how different it is, is, you know, not normal. So of course the ones that are slightly longer than the, these ones, well, they, they are slightly longer because they didn't get chewed up like these ones did. Anyway, the customer was on the verge of doing a brand new short block because we don't even know what the hell we're gonna find once we pull the cylinder head off. Hopefully nothing alarming so we can just proceed with this. Of course, we're gonna get them new springs. We're gonna get them new valves. They either installed new seats and like I said, didn't check the proper uh, installed height of the valve itself and the protrusion essentially. Or what happened is they used valves that were tipped. So sometimes what guys will do is like on cylinder heads that use bucket style lifters, instead of swapping lifters around, they'll just tip the top of the valve for that specific cylinder and uh, install it to get the proper clearance for the camshaft lobe. It ends up not damaging the actual valve spring because you know you have a bucket, like a 4B11 bucket. Hyundai uses this as well, a lot of manufacturers do. So you have this touching the top of the valve stem instead of, um, you know, the, the essentially a rocker which has nubs on the side. So this one still doesn't, of course, th these sides aren't touching. They're not supposed to be touching, but you guys can see how much more protrusion it has on the actual nubs compared to where um, the part of the rocker where, the, where it makes contact with the tip of the valve. So with that being said, maybe there were some um, valves that were, well, it can't be 4B11 valves because they're a completely different size. And, length and stuff but uh maybe it was used in a different project or something or they just they just did it completely wrong whenever they installed new seats or something we're gonna find out 
uh, that well, it really doesn't matter. Our machine shop, you know, does this properly. Of course, we're gonna to replace the valve springs as well. While we're at it, we're gonna throw some conicals in there. So um, these are beehives, but I can't tell if they're 5041s or 5040s. And again, it's just, uh, you know, I'd rather replace it all anyway. Uh, with the GSC stuff, I love using all their valve train components, but you do kind of have to measure the spring rates right out of the box. They could be, you know, all over the place. So you might need to shim some of them, uh, but nothing alarming, very easily adjusted by a, you know, machinist that's a machinist really. So everything's off. I think manifolds pushed back. Exhaust manifolds uh, pulled back. Thermostat housings pulled off. Cams are obviously off. Everything in the front is taken off. Head studs are loosened. This particular combo has L19s, which work very well. If the uh, stud itself is not compromised, it's made out of a material that's very sensitive. So you have to wear gloves when you're handling it and you don't want to get it extremely dirty. Cause then it just, you know, once it gets exposed to the elements and the oils of your hands and stuff, you know, it can wreak havoc on this, uh, on the, I think it's a coating that it has. I'm not particularly sure, so feel free to jump in the comments. I don't use L19s, I use 625s, and I know they're, they're a superior material, and uh, it's you know, nothing's gonna happen if you touch them with your bare hands. Not to say that I haven't done that and installed them. They still work perfectly fine, but they do get compromised. This is directly from ARP, so. Anyway, um, there's an HLA there, like I mentioned yesterday, so that's good. Um, but yeah, we're gonna put the cylinder head off. We're gonna look at the surface of the cylinder head. We're gonna look at the surface of the block. We're gonna look at the pistons. And then we'll end this video here, and then we'll come back to this whenever we get the cylinder head back and put it together. Of course, we're gonna have a dyno video on this, uh, on this particular car, so. See you guys in a minute. So, the cylinder head's taken off. Fortunately, nothing's wrong with the bottom end. I don't see any signs of detonation or anything odd going on in the bottom end. Um, of course, the pistons look great because I was the one that calibrated this car. Uh, but no, in all reality, um, everything looks good. Um, I did go ahead and clean it up. A little bit of scotch bite. You gotta be careful with scotch bite on the surface. Uh, every time I use scotch bite, I, I'll cover these holes with uh, something that I can pull out very easily. Some, uh, I usually like to use the these clean wipes. I use those for engine building, so uh, they're fairly lint-free. Um, nothing's lint-free, but that's as close as you're gonna get. So I stuff them in there, and then I'll, I'll lightly take off whatever there is on the surface. In this case, there was the copper spray, which I hate. Uh, please, if you're trying to put an Evo cylinder head together, put the copper spray down. It's just, it doesn't really do anybody any favors. Posit head gasket, it'll help you, but if it's not, you're wasting your time, seriously. The cylinder head, doesn't look bad everything looks pretty normal aside from the fact that it's been shaved uh down quite a bit so there's probably maybe seven thou seven eight thou material left if that and usually there's there's a good amount maybe like 15 18 thou something like that so this thing's been milled down quite a damn bit you can kind of tell when it starts touching the bottom of the intake manifold so we don't need to do a lot to clean this up maybe just a kiss maybe a thou um because we weren't having any head gasket issues so what we want to do is just get this obviously you know just just flat uh, then we're going to o-ring it uh, then we're gonna use the Evo 9 head gasket, although this is an Evo 8. The Evo 9 is a five layer head gasket. Uh, it's about 44 thou, crushed. Does seem like he has nine, nine to one pistons. So, you know, very forgiving when it comes to tuning, and especially uh, this car being on E, it's just that much more, um, you know, easier to calibrate. Every compression is if you know what you're doing and you're careful with it, but this is just a perfect case scenario. So um, at this point, what we're looking at, guys, is just the uh, cylinder head R&R. &R. Uh, we are going to replace the valves, of course. Uh, you know, if we're going to replace the exhaust valves, I just like to replace the intake valves anyway. They're not GSC valves. They look like Super Techs. Nothing wrong with the Super Techs. I like the GSC exhaust valves because they offer the super alloy material. So if you're, you know, shooting flames or if you're on the two-step, you know, and you're getting these valves super hot, they're not going to melt away. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So um, this video is going to conclude here. At this point, the customer has authorized the work. We've already taken a partial payment, as we always do. And um, the cylinder head is going to go to the machine shop. And by Monday or Tuesday, we're going to have it back and put it all together. Up next, uh, it's my client Martin's car. He dropped the valve. He was on the stock valve train and he dropped the valve and kind of destroyed the bottom end. So we got him hooked up with a sleeved SPL 1000, which I haven't assembled yet, but it's already back from Aaron from Arlington Machine. 
and uh, I'm gonna put it together. And there's a stage three CNC cylinder head that we're gonna put together for him. Fuel system and all that good stuff. So that's gonna be a separate video. But for now, this is where we're gonna conclude it. Just make sure, of course, whenever you have a failure, make sure everything that has oil in it either gets replaced if uh, you know you, there's no means of cleaning it, i.e. you know the cam gear, if it's an EVO 9, for instance, the Mavic cam gear, you gotta take that thing apart and clean everything, make sure the apex seals don't have anything rubbing up against the actual gear or the plastic, and then like stuff like oil cooler and uh, anything along those lines that you cannot clean, you gotta replace absolutely. I mean, there's just no questions asked. And uh, just anything that has oil going through, the oil filter housing has to be thoroughly cleaned. Your turbocharger, if it ha you've had a failure and you know it's it's been a failure that it wasn't abrupt, you gotta send the turbocharger in because if the oil circulates, it's gonna feed and go through the turbo. Uh, you know, there's gonna be small particles that will go into the turbo no matter, you know, what kind of a failure you have. So just remember that anything that touches oil needs to be addressed. Um, so in this case, it seems like it's home stretch, home run, whatever you want to call it, everything is looking good. We just got to take care of the top end, O-ring it so we can push the boost levels that we wanted to push, Evo 9 head gasket, you know, our proprietary O-rings, a recipe to, you know, make over 800 horsepower, you know, without having any issues. And of course, like I said, this car is going to go on a Haltech, so that's going to be a separate video. But for now, thank you guys for checking in. Hope you guys you know picked up something learned something if you guys got any questions or if you guys want to discuss something in the comments below and we'll be in touch and as always thank you guys for watching i appreciate the support and we'll see you guys in the next one